Hey Flosstube, it's Kim back again with another cross stitching update. This is Flosstube number 57. Today is the 24th of February 2020. We're almost done with the month, believe it or not. Um, so I can't believe last week I actually completely forgot to mention plans. So this will be a surprise. What did I work on this week? Unless you follow me on Instagram, uh, I'm at Spartan Stitcher. So I worked on three pieces this week. Um, I couldn't put these cute little animals down that I'm working on for the commission piece. Uh, again, this is Zoom lineup by the trilogy that I am modifying to make it all safari animals. So I'm taking out the swan, the penguin, and the panda, and I'm going to put safari animals in there. And I finished everything that I'm doing as charted. So let me get the... I didn't baste my fabric or surge my fabric or anything. So so there it is as it stands. I did change the colors on um, the giraffe. I changed the color of the spots. And on the crocodiles, I changed the color of their belly to make it a light green that you see there. Um, the giraffe, I'll show you the model picture so you can see. It had lighter spots. Okay, that's fine for if you want to be cutesy, but uh, that's not what giraffes look like. And then the crocodiles had this yellowish golden color on their bellies. Well, crocodiles have green, you know, like a, a pale green skin on their bellies. So I changed it. So we are all set for the modifications for the animals going in here, as well as uh, what letters and words I'm going to put here. I have started playing around with this space on my charting software. Um, tried a couple different things so far, but I ran out of time because of everything that was happening this week. Um, so, and plus, I'm not happy with what I made yet, and because I have enough time, I'm just going to keep working on it. Um, my first attempts had a cape buffalo and a cheetah, and then another one also. So I had the cheetah in two different positions. I had it um, standing like the like the lion here and, and you know, the hippo and the rhino. Um, but, you know, I, I had the cape buffalo here and putting a cheetah in. I'm like, wouldn't it be funny if the cheetah was actually running towards the, towards the buffalo? Now, none of the other animals are showing action. Um, so I think that would kind of stand out and not fit with the piece. But I did it just because it was fun um and I had to see if it what would it what it would look like um so I'm happy with the cape buffalo we'll see if the cheetah remains or if I make something else um the ostrich is cute too but again everything's got to fit just right maybe I'll put the ostrich here so its body can go well we'll figure it out again the baby's not due until July so I have time to keep playing around with this um so I don't know if I'll I probably this week play around still with designing. I, um, I don't think I'll get around to actually stitching more on it, but you'll see. And then the next thing I worked on that I didn't have a chance to tell you about, I did my monthly rotation on Big Red Ship of Life by Ink Circles, and I am in the second row of pages. So I'm on the first page here just about you're just below that first level of the um call it floor part of the mast so um i had done like this part and this border and i put in 12 over 1200 stitches so i can show you here what i worked on i put in this guy the tree this motif here, I did the entire sail and all this down here and all of that. So that's where the page is. So for March, I just have to fill in the rest of that page. Um, so let me compare. So it'll be three more people with a little pavilion thing they're standing under will go in that space so that's where I'm at on this again um, 28 count 
Mushroom Even Weave by MCG Textiles using DMC 3808. So that's where Big Red Ship of Life is. And this is still on track to be done in four years to represent our time here in North Dakota. And then the other piece I worked on because I told you I'm obsessed with it and I can't put it down is I kept working on Museum Shelf. Last week I showed you my page finish here in the corner with a Triceratops skull. Um, and so I kept working on this page where you see that bluish purplish book. You see the, the green and black book, uh, the Nautilus shell, and there looks like a, a rock or something here with the leg of this dinosaur. So that's the area I'm working. I finished up my park, which I forgot to put my sticker in my book. Um, I finished up the park because I had like 3,700 stitches, 10 stitches I still had to do. Um, and then, so I finished up the park early this morning and I still had time before lunch and before taking my youngest to preschool. So I did another 350 tent stitches after that because now it's like, okay, I finished the park, but I'm nowhere near page finish. So let's just go to the next, you know, like I'm not, I'm not ready to be done working on it. So I'm just going to keep, keep working on it. So there she is. You can, I mean, it's clear to see. Here's where the Nautilus shell is going to be. There you have your, your green and black book, your blue book. Um, here's where the rock is. And this is going to be uh, the leg of that dinosaur. So really happy working on this. This page is coming together pretty easily. And it's a lot of fun to work on. So I'm going to keep working on it. So I have finished Carlsbad Caverns on this one. I now have four parks done. Um, and I've already posted my starting point for Everglades in Tier 2. I still have one park left in Tier 1, but I'll talk about that in a minute. I just can't stop looking at it. I love my dinosaurs. So... I will keep working on that one. Okay, plans for the next week and a little bit um, for the month. I have not worked on Macintosh Mill yet this month, and that is my piece for Full Coverage Fanatics uh, 20 in 2020. So I'm, I'm going to be doing 20,000 stitches on it or getting a finish on it, whatever comes first. So that's Macintosh Mill Dimensions Kit with artwork by Charles Waisaki. And I started on this side of the piece. So I have done none of this yet. So it may look like it's close to a finish if I just like crop the piece, but I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, so since you haven't seen it in a while, I'll show you where I'm at. Wouldn't it be cool if I could just finish up this section and get to work on the back stitching? Some of this is uh, 10 stitch, some of it is full cross because we have the water coming down over the stones. So that's where I am. Um, I'm using this for the first park, which is Acadia, and I have 2,500 stitches out of 4,000 done. So. I want to get that park done this month. Um, I haven't even counted the squares to see. That's not 15 squares. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It's almost. It's close. But um, then I have backstitching to do. And backstitching does count, but you have to uh, count each one as half a stitch. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll fill this in. We'll start on backstitching and see if I can finish up that park. So I can be done for tier one. So I'm going to work on that this week. I'm going to catch up on um, the Peppermint Purple uh, 52 Weeks of Blackwork uh, Sal. I did not bring that to show you. I've got two weeks to catch up on. Plus the next week comes out on Wednesday uh, for the row finish. on the, the second row on that piece. So hopefully I'll have that done to show you next week. 
Um, and then for March in Full Coverage Fanatics, for the Around the World, uh, we're visiting Canada. And um, I had to do some research to, to see how my whips could fit Canada. And come to find out, um, the national apple for Can Canada is a Macintosh. So I'll be working on this in March, both for 20 and 20 and around the world. Um, so I had to pick another piece to work on besides museum shelf and Macintosh mill. I need another piece to work on because I, I always, you're so far in the two months, I've worked on at least three, three full coverage pieces in a month. So I decided to uh, work on the piece that's been the longest without me working on it, which is Oh Baby, uh, artwork by Gail Gash Taylor. Um, her artwork is retiring, may already be retired. I will, I will put a link to her page in the description box if she's not already retired. I know it was a mid-month, I can't remember if it was mid-February or mid-March that her artwork was retiring from the Hayed website. Um, so I'm cropping this one to fit the fabric and because that's all unnecessary background. Uh, the last time I worked on this, I used it for Full Coverage Fanatics 90 Day Challenge last year for quarter two. So the last day I worked on this was the 30th of June. So it's been a while. Um, pretty much I got color burnt out from all the greens and um, browns. So, uh, there's, there's my, my baby. So I am, I don't know yet if I'm going to do this page or the page in the middle for his other eye. I'll do one of those pages. I think there's a partial page here too. Um, so I'll do one of those, I'll start one of those pages for March. I'll um, also use it for a uh, national park, probably Glacier or Grand Canyon, depending how far I get on uh, Macintosh Mill, which one I, I finish, whether I finish um, Acadia and start the next park, that'll be Glacier, or if I start on this first, then that'll be Glacier. But. Um, that is my plans for May for full coverage pieces. Let's see, what else? Um, so, so far for the month of February, my full coverage uh, stitch total, I had over 4,000 equivalent on uh, Friends Forever and now over 4,000 on Museum Shelf, plus the 350 I did in excess of that already today. So, but that's the 350s 10 stitch, so 8,175 so far. Um, and the minimum to keep going, you know, to, to split up the 100,000 for the parks is 8,333. But last month I was ahead. Um, that was 11,000 something. So I'm still going to be ahead, which is good because Girl Scout cookie season has started. Um, my oldest daughter and I are going to be working sales booths, cookie sales booths at different places around town and on base, the commissary and the shop at. Um, we worked at the mall this past weekend. We're working at an off base grocery store. And yeah, the commissary and the shop at. <coughs> so at least one booth every single weekend is craziness. Um, it makes you tired. So even though it's only a two hour booth, you come home and I'm just meant physically tired from standing up and, and moving around, but mentally tired as well because it was nonstop selling cookies for two hours. Um, it was very busy because it was lunchtime at the mall just outside the food court. Um, so, and that was just part of my week. Um, a little more life update for the week. Instead of driving my truck like I have been since my husband's deployed, I needed my car to store all the cookies in. And even though it's been less than a month since I drove it, my car battery was completely dead. Like, nothing. You open the door, the dash didn't light up, the interior lights didn't light up, my battery was completely dead. 
um, hooked up the jumper cables from the truck to the car. I know it was charging because um, the lights did go on in my car when I opened up the door and I was able to attempt one start of the car, but then a really cool safety security issue um, on my car locked itself. So it's one of those push button starts. So you have to put your foot on the brake and, and push the button, but my brake locked up so I could hardly push on it and I couldn't, couldn't do anything. There is an override for that, but you have to have at least a little bit of juice in your battery to do so because you need your dash lit up. So, um, and I wasn't just going to let the truck hook, stay hooked up to the car forever and ever. So I pulled out the little tiny plug in the wall car battery charger, hooked that up, let it sit for about four hours. It only charged it up to about 32% of the battery, but wouldn't go any farther. So I crossed my fingers. I had enough power to do the override um, and enough to get it started, barely. Like, we're talking not a healthy sounding car. Um, and you know, usually you can take your car out of park and take your foot off the brake and the car will idle forward. It didn't idle forward. It was in drive, foot off the brake, not moving. It didn't even have enough power to idle, to, you know, go to idling speed. So I had to gas it to get it out of my driveway. Um, and then, you know, packed up my youngest, put her in the car so we could drive to town and back to charge up the battery. Luckily after that, um, the car has been starting fine. But I definitely won't be leaving it sitting in the garage for weeks without starting it. It hasn't even been that cold, but... It is an older battery. And then the other thing that happened, uh, Saturday morning, 4.45 in the morning, my, my dog got sick. Uh, she was throwing up and then she had issues on the other end. And it was, a, it was a weekend of, you know, take the dog out lots of times. Uh, luckily she's getting better and I did not have to take her to the vet. I was able to treat her issues by myself. So it's been a week. Um, oh, and I also had to give her a bath because, yeah, she smelled. So, all right. Uh, that is all of my stitching slash regular life updates. Um, I want to thank everyone who does watch, even if you don't stay for the Air Force stories. I have looked at my uh, analytics on YouTube and I know that my average watch time is right about now when I say this, the end of my stitching. But I also get a whole lot of comments saying they really do appreciate the Air Force story. So I'm going to continue to, to do them because there are at least a few of you who enjoy them. So uh, if you are headed out to watch your next Floss Tube video, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next week. And now it's Air Force story time. For my new subscribers, I am an Air Force veteran and currently a dependent spouse. My husband is active duty and deployed. Um, I was an aircraft maintenance officer for seven and a half years, so a lot of my stories are aircraft and maintenance related. Um, a few weeks ago, I explained to you how uh, safety investigation boards work and different classes of, safe, of uh, aircraft mishaps. Um, I did have saved a short little PowerPoint of a Class A mishap that occurred early 2004 in Lakenheath. Um, that is on the east side of the United Kingdom in the county of Suffolk. Um, so I, I have a little bit of a narrative here. I'll read it to you because it'll be hard for you to read if I show it on the screen. Um, and then some pictures. So Class A mishap, in this case... Um, there were injuries, but no fatalities, but there was well over $2 million worth of aircraft damage. So it hit both requirements for this to be a class A mishap. Um, one of my other stories I told you about when I was TDY at Nellis and we were giving incentive rides to my uh, crew chiefs and one of them had a left main or a, a main tire blowout on landing. And that ground down the, the uh, wheel and the tire and the brake so the aircraft was stuck on the runway for an hour. Okay, same problem. So we have we still have 
a main tire that uh, blew on landing, but this completely different result. Um, I don't know if it blew during a different, like my crew chief, if he had already slowed down enough before it blew. Um, but this jet at Lake and Heath, it was as soon as it touched down, the tire blew. So the aircraft was still nose up, still going 150 knots, um, and the tire blew. Now I'm going to try to, you know, you can watch my hand and listen to me talk as, as I go through this narrative. Uh, these jets were returning from Nellis, so had just crossed the Atlantic Ocean back to England. Um, and this was the last jet to land. Uh, so the, the left main tire blew. The aircraft twisted to the left because obviously it doesn't have the tire to, to uh, stand on. Slid sideways, nose down, and is and um, listed, you know, turned to the left because it's, it's dragging that left main landing gear. Turned to the left off the runway. The front end of the jet dug into the ground, causing the jet to stand up on its nose. And at that point, the fuselage, the body of the airplane, broke right behind the cockpit and right in front of the intakes of the engine. And... Um, the cockpit broke around and bent the other direction. When the jet finally stopped, the ray dome, the nose cone, was separated from the fuselage uh, and was lying 20 feet away. Um, the jet is basically trashed. Uh, the pilot received cuts, scrapes, and bruises. He's in the front seat. The weapon system officer um, had both of his arms broken and numerous cuts and bruises. Based on the wreckage, safety said the air crew was lucky to be alive. Uh, okay, so here is some of these pictures are fuzzy at the beginning. Um, an aerial shot of what it looked like. So here you have the runway. Um, the end of the runway is off the picture, but you can see where it gouged the runway as it took this path off and then hit the grass off the runway and spun around. The aircraft is now pointed that way. So it completely, it, you know, came up, going to the left, stood up on its nose, broke, and ended up pointing back towards the runway. Uh, fuzzy picture of ground that had been dug up as it traveled. And here's a clearer picture of this jet. So you can see one of the training missiles. You can tell it's training. It obviously, it wouldn't still be almost whole like that. Um, you have part of the canopy over here. Here you have the front of the fuselage on its side. You're looking down into what would normally be the top of the canopy, where the pilots, or of the cockpit, where the pilots sit. Here, you have the ray dome, that nose cone. You're looking on the inside of it, so it's pointed um, away from you. And so there you have a better picture. You see that here's the engine intakes, and there's uh, the cockpit on its side. The white foamy stuff is fire suppression foam, so you know nothing would catch fire after it stopped moving. And there's another picture. Um, we have a trash bag covering the front of the nose just because um, toxic materials are in there that you don't want to be airborne and spreading all over. So that's one of the first things they do when they come upon a wreckage is uh, cover up any spot. Depending on the airframe, you'll have different dangers <coughs> to those people walking around the wreckage, so they cover that up. And then, so there's the HUD, the heads-up display, where the pilot would look through. And so here's where the pilot would sit and where the uh, weapon system officer would sit. So it broke right behind him. So that's why he had a rougher ride and more injuries. Now, in this case, uh, the Safety Investigation Board, they don't have to 
um, investigate to figure out the cause of the crash. They know that. The main tire blew. Um, the investigation would be about why did the main tire blow. Now, um, in aircraft maintenance for the Air Force, and probably this is goes for commercial airplanes as too, commercial airplanes too, um, tires are built with layers of rubber and in between those layers are different materials that are easily visible. Uh, we call them cords, so that as the tires wear down, you can say there's one cord showing, there's two cords showing, three cords. And um, depending on what kind of aircraft it's on, um, there's different limitations. Like if, if it's a main tire, um, maybe two cords showing, you have to change the tire. But if it's a nose tire, because those hit last at a slower speed, you might be able to hit, you know, have three cords um, become visible before you have to change a tire. Now, when those cords become visible, so you, you know, you're looking at a round tire, but when it lands, there's always that moment where um, before the, the wheel starts turning, it's like rubbing the, the rubber off the tire. So you end up with a wear spot that's round. So when those cords show up, it's, you'll have like a round spot with a, a white circle and then more wear and then another white circle would be two cords showing. So uh, if there's only one white circle, that's one cord showing. So even though we call it a cord, it shows up as a layer uh, within the, the rubber that's rubbed off. So the investigation board, I don't have the results for that one, but you can bet that it's going to be focused on the maintenance side to determine when that jet uh, departed Nellis, how many cords were showing on those tires. They're going to talk to the crew chiefs. Um, it may have been their fault if, the, if it was like really, really close to having too many cords showing um, and just happened to land at that, that worst spot on that tire. Or it may have been, no, the tire was within limits and it was just a hard landing and the tire blew. Um, so that's what happens in the, in the safety investigation course if they already know um, how it happened. They still have to determine why it happened so they can stop it from happening again in the future. So there's your Air Force story for the day or for the week. Um, I hope everybody has a good stitching week and we'll see you next time. Bye guys.